Hello everyone and a warm welcome in joining us for the President's Design Award first ever webinar in the Education and Career series, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly of a Visual Communications Career. I am Patient from the Design Singapore Council and your MC for today. The President's Design Award or PDA for short is Singapore's highest accolade for designers and designs across all disciplines. Organized by the Design Singapore Council and the Urban Redevelopment Authority, this is the 13th cycle of the award. Our latest crowd of 11 recipients were awarded on 30th of June this year. A couple of house rules just to keep today's session running as smoothly as possible. Firstly, please be informed that this webinar will be recorded and that your microphones will be muted throughout the session. You are most welcome to submit questions through the Zoom Q&A function and the speakers will address them during the Q&A segment. Should you encounter any technical issues, please ping our technical team through the Zoom chat function. In this very first edition of the PDA Education and Career Series, students and fresh graduates interested in a career in design will have an up-close and personal opportunity to dialogue with the recipients of Singapore's highest design accolade. What is the progression of a career in design like? How is the design profession transforming in response to evolving trends? And what are some of the greatest struggles and triumphs in their journey? And what advice do they have for young designers? These are just some of the many questions that our panel of speakers will be tackling today. It is now my pleasure to introduce the recipients on our panel. Ms. Kelly Chain, Creative Director of the Press Room and PDA 2020 Designer of the Year. Ms. Ashwin Salim, Creative Director of Kinetic Singapore and PDA 2020 Design of the Year for the Not So Convenient Store. Mr. Steve Lawler, Co founder and Head of Creative of AYA and PDA 2020 Design of the Year for AYA. Mr. Larry Pei, Founder and Creative Director of N. Larry and PDA 2014 Designer of the Year. Larry was also a member of the PDA 2020 Design Jury Panel. Our moderator for today is Mr. Felix Lee, co-founder and CEO of the global mentorship platform Amazing Design People ADP List, which allows people to book and meet mentors from around the world. Now, before we begin the session, we'd like to get to know a little bit more about you. On the poll that we just launched on the screen, please share with us which design disciplines you are from. So there will be a total of 10 options. You can choose multiple options that are applicable to you. And if you select other design disciplines or even other non-design disciplines, please feel free to share it with us in the Zoom chat function. Okay, visual communications is winning. They're the majority vote. Just allow a couple more seconds to allow the responses to come streaming in. Okay, so nice to see that most of you are from the visual communications discipline, followed by architecture, advertising, and design research and design strategy. Thank you so much for your participation. We now jump straight into the sharing by our speakers. Without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, Kelly Ching. Trained as an architect, Kelly is the founder and creative director of The Press Room, a publishing and design consultancy with projects that include publications, brands, exhibitions, documentaries, and even stage and film set design. An active educator and a passionate champion of design over her two-decade career, she has served as adjunct lecturer in Singapore universities and has sat on international design judging panels, including Red Dot Awards, Nagoya Nagoya Do Design for Asia Award, Creative Circle Award, and the James Dyson Award. Kelly, over to you, please. Thank you, patient. Okay, I'm going to start to uh, share my screen first. Can uh, everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. All good. Okay. Okay. So, uh, hi guys. For for those who uh, have never encountered the press room or, or myself, uh, we are the press room is a, a interdisciplinary uh, design studio. So we do uh, a variety of uh, different genres of design, from graphic to spatial to digital to multimedia. So it's uh, really quite a, a mixed bag of uh, of things that we do here. And uh, so I would like to start my talk today by uh, sharing about uh, how or why I got into design. 
Um, for me, I believe it is uh, both nature and nurture. Uh, since young, I love to draw uh, and I would draw anywhere. I draw on the wall, draw on my bed, draw everywhere. Until my mom uh, gave up. So at four years old, she, uh, she checked me into a, a painting school. I started drawing with crayon and uh, I, I continued throughout uh, till my uh, till secondary school. Uh, so mastering different uh, forms of uh, medium in, in drawing. Um, I think since young, I always am attracted to, to something uh, beautiful. So I, I have the tendency to also want to create, you know, sort of my own uh, form of beauty. Uh, I didn't know what design meant then. Uh, all I knew was that uh, I want to, I, I thought that I want to be an artist really. <laughs> um, but in secondary school, I actually picked up uh, photography, which, which I fell in love with. So uh, I start to kind of venture into different forms of creativity that could help me to uh, achieve um, in my creation of uh, beauty. So I think if someone naturally has an interest, then you will find your own ways uh, to kind of get this passion uh, to be nurtured into something. So uh, these are some of my works I did as a teenager. So growing up in secondary school, um, I always volunteer myself, you know. They say, oh, I'll, fester, I say, I'll do the flyer. Oh, uh, a poster, I'll do it. I do anything. Uh, it's all free, but I love to do it. I just want to do it. I just want uh, my design to be appreciated by, by everyone. I think there is a sense of satisfaction and reward that is uh, unexplainable. It's really beyond what uh, money can buy. So even as a teenager, I will seize every single opportunity uh, just, you know, for that uh, 15 minutes of fame. So I was a big fan of Andy Warhol, as you can see, I even painted him for one of my uh, poster design for university. So uh, growing up, there was an indie music magazine called Big O. Uh, the older folks here will know, the younger ones uh, probably have not heard of it. But it was then uh, the only music magazine, actually today also still, right? Because there's no music magazine in Singapore, but a very, very indie, very raw. And um, I volunteered myself there. Uh, they, they have no budget. So I did everything for free. I took photos, uh, I did paintings for them. Uh, all these are the, some of the covers that I did which led me to doing uh, my very first commercial work, which you can see there, the Odd Fellas uh, CD cover. I think Odd Fellas just released their third and latest album, but uh, the first one was done by me. And during that time, I didn't know how to use, there was no InDesign, huh? there, was, uh, there was only Pitch Maker, uh, which I, I didn't have access to because in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, having a Mac is very, very expensive. Uh, so your parents won't buy for you. So I used my own painting methods and uh, to, to kind of simulate the sealed screen effect, I actually uh, photostat uh, different layers of imageries, partial images onto uh, photostatic films, you know, then I kind of like manually stitch everything together and you get this uh, image there on the cover, the Ophelous. It's actually a, a portrait of Elvis as a, as a boy because it's called Teenage 8. So it was also the first time I attempted to do something uh, conceptual and I got quite addicted to it. That was only when I, I think I did that when I was 17, 18 years old, around some of your age now. Um, so yeah, so I think growing up, um, I, I, always, uh, I always try to find opportunities for me to do something creative and it was never about money, you know, it was really uh, just to be able to do uh, what I love, you know, and to be appreciated. So this uh, journey uh, led me to, um, to architecture school. Uh, which was because in the 90s, uh, unlike you guys now who are very, very fortunate, there are a variety of uh, design schools available for your choice in Singapore now. But in the early 90s, uh, in fact, that was late 80s, um, if you want to go to uh, do anything, uh, you want to do a design degree, uh, your choice is really quite limited to only uh, architecture at the National University. That's assuming if your parents have no money to send you abroad. Uh, so yeah, I went to architecture school and uh, after I graduated, uh, six years. Um, I still very much knew that my first love is in graphic, in creating graphic, in writing, in taking photos and all that. So after a short stint uh, in architecture um, and then a long travel of a year, uh, kind of like searching my soul, <laughs> I came back to Singapore and in 1999, uh, I, I, I decided to uh, 
make my own dream come true. So all along, uh, I always feel that uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of like different indie magazines and cool magazines and all that. Uh, so growing up, I look at The Face, I look at, uh, you know, Bikini, I look at Ray Gun and, you know, the usual staple of indie magazines in the 80s and 90s. And, and that dream uh, has always been in me that one day I want to start my own magazine uh, because it combines all my passion, which is writing, photography, uh, graphic design, typography, things like that. So in 1999, I, um, I gathered my guts and courage and uh, I just uh, blindly started my own publishing firm uh, and published uh, this magazine called Ish. Uh, the tagline is called Fragments of an Urban Scape which is why I call it ish, because ish in itself is always a fragment of a word. So the idea is to really capture all aspects of, of, uh, of the city, because to me, uh, every, everything in life is design, you know, everything. Uh, we need design for everything. So it really is a fragment of that urban scape. Uh, this magazine was uh, launched uh, at the uh, before the internet days, and then it went into the beginning of the internet days. So we were quite lucky, you know. So sometimes people say timing is everything. So during that time, because there was no internet, so our magazine was a uh, was quite a hit, you know. Uh, and and I would say that it really, uh, looking back now, I I really have to thank this magazine because it has really. Uh, uh, allow me to connect with the industry, not just Singapore, also uh, also abroad, the global design industry in a, in a very uh, broad way. And up to today, a lot of the friends that I made through this magazine uh, are still my friends today. And uh, I forgot to mention why I also was very keen to start this magazine because as I shared earlier, as a teenager, I, I have no platforms to showcase my passion, you know, I want to create, I'll take photo, even for free also, no place to go, you know, that's how sad it was. So I want each magazine to be a, a magazine that, you know, young creatives like me have a place to showcase their talent, have a place to, you know, we can jam together, uh, everybody can contribute what they want, can contribute photography, can contribute writing, whatever, you see. So that was really the vision of the magazine also, to propel the Singapore brand to provide a platform for Singapore designers like myself to, to kind of shine and share our works with the world. So uh, I did each for 10 years, 1999 to 2009. And then in 2009, I started uh, the press room. So uh, guys, I think maybe many of you might wonder if you should start your own studio, if you should work for someone or whatever. Actually, nothing is wrong. You know, it's, it's really up to you. Um, but my advice to you is that uh, work somewhere for a few years first, you know, learn your ropes first. Um, and when you're ready, then start. Don't, don't be in a hurry to start because it is not, not easy running a studio. You know, you, you have bills to pay, you, you have staff to pay, you need to look for clients. And uh, there's actually a lot of nitty gritty things that you have to worry about uh, every single day. So it might, running a studio uh, might not be for everyone. Uh, hence, I urge you guys to think carefully uh, before you start uh, your own design studio because don't start for the wrong reasons. Don't start because you think that you can make a lot of money or whatever, you know. Um, you, you need to have a higher aspiration, you see. So I think for me, it was quite clear why I want to start my own studio because since a kid, since a teenage and all that, my passion is to create beautiful things for people to enjoy, you know, like a chef who cooks something nice, you want people to eat it, taste it, and wow, you know, it tastes so good. And that will make your day, you know, you, you don't even care people pay for your food or not, but someone to say that this tastes so great, you know, I, I think I, I can identify with that feeling. So for me, the aspiration to create uh, beautiful things uh, is, is very, very important to me without someone nagging at me, you know, uh, oh, you must do this, you must do that and all that, but, but to be able to create. I think this is also why the reason that the press room uh, undertake a lot of projects for non-profit organizations. Um, we, because for me, it, it is important to put bread on the table. We, we need to strike a balance. But I, if I have to run a studio, doing only annual reports, I, I would rather kill myself, you know, or I would rather go and be a lawyer or a doctor. Because it is so uh, 
soul killing, you know, you kill your soul if you keep on doing annual report. And I know some design companies, I wouldn't even call them studios, some design companies, uh, they, they specialize in doing annual report. I can't even imagine that. I mean, that, that would be so uh, scary. I, I do only one or two annual reports a year, only for my regular clients, just more as a favor. Because annual report is really not fun, guys. So I choose to do, um, you know, to balance. Uh, of course, we have some uh, commercial jobs and all that. Even in the commercial jobs, we try to give our best, I always give a, a sort of a twist to it. But the other 50% of the time, we spend a lot of time uh, creating uh, things for non-profit organizations. They, they usually don't have a lot of budget, but a lot of them are very open-minded and allow us to do things that are very creative. I work with a lot of artists, you know, uh, artists have no money, but they have good taste. So they will come to me and say, can you make my book? Can you make my video box set? Can you make this and that? And they will always say 100% freehand to you, Kelly, because we respect the creative process, just like because they are also artists and they understand how important it is. So we do a lot of work for visual artists. We do a lot of work for uh, dance company, theatre companies, uh, etc you know for posters books and all that and i i think it is a really um uh that kind of um uh, the passion to do beautiful things and also the empathy to be able to share good design without um without judging like who the client is and all that um and i think that to me um is very important because i think beauty is so powerful you know last year during covid the papers say that uh, artists or art is the, the most unimportant uh, 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 profession, you know, during COVID. And I totally disagree with that. I think, I think artists and designers, we have the power, you know, to create beauty, which, which provides the purest and simplest, basic, most basic form of happiness to people. When you go to East Coast and you watch a sunrise or a sunset, it's so beautiful, you know, it's something that you, you feel so moved and, and it's priceless, you know, and everybody can enjoy it. You look at, you go to Botanical Garden, you look at the trees, you look at the butterflies and you feel so happy in your heart. It's free, you know, and I hope that the press room here, we want to create works that provide people with the same kind of enjoyment and happiness without people having to pay. So when people pick up a, a product design and ask, wow, this is so beautiful. And for that moment, you know, the world stops. And you just provide that most simplest form of beauty to people. And I think that is priceless. So uh, the, other, the other thing that uh, as I get a little bit older, um, I also find that it's very important for me to, to find meaning in, in what I do. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, yes, I mean, to be realistic, you need to do beautiful things. You need to make money. You need to balance both, you see, uh, because you have staff and all that. You also want them to be paid decently and all that. But for a small studio, to be honest, we, we cannot compare to the big advertising firms and all that. But, but the, the, in exchange for that, you know, you can have a much more meaningful career knowing that you have created beautiful things and for worthy causes. So anyway, uh, so as I, as I go along and I've been doing that, uh, and now as I'm getting even a little bit older, I, I'm just uh, thinking how I can do more for the community. And I, I think it's really important for, uh, for us to keep the design ecosystem, you know, the older people to mentor the younger ones and all that, so that we can create a design history and then a design culture can evolve, you know, because if whatever that we learn our experiences and all that uh, does not get passed on, then uh, we, we won't be able to complete this uh, ecosystem for our Singapore design community. So uh, in the recent years, I dedicated a lot of my time uh, giving talks like that, giving talks to school, um, mentoring young designers, uh, spending more time teaching in school and, and all that. And I find that it gives a, a different meaning uh, to my work as a, as a designer. So I think that is also uh, an important aspect. Um, okay, so, so along the same line, uh, last year COVID uh, was, was very, it was a struggle for most companies, including us. Um, a lot of our jobs are tied to marketing and events and they were all stopped. So uh, we, we don't have a lot of things to do. So I started to think like, what, so what can I, what can I do? You know, something that is meaningful uh, during this uh, quiet period. And um, I decided to do this project, this archival and documentation project called Studio SML. Um, because I realized that a lot of our 
uh, first generation graphic designers, third generation architects, uh, and all that they they are slowly dwindling away and passing on, and we we don't know who they are, you know, because sometimes when I lecture, I refer you know to some of these uh, architects or designers, and and my students all blur, you no know, blur face. So I got very worried, like, huh? How can you not know these guys? They are like the the masters of Singapore, you know. So uh, it triggered me to want to do this project, uh, to to document. Uh, the stories and journeys of Singapore designers of all genres. The more I can document, the, the better. It is a self-initiated, uh, self-funded project with support from Design Singapore, which I'm very grateful for. Um, so last year, we, we spent the whole year building up uh, on this project, um, making this vision come true. Um, and this will be a lifelong uh, project for me, my, my commitment to the design community, and I will continue to do this until I die. Yeah, so uh, we, uh, like I said, it's, it's not an easy job. So uh, whoever that wants to come and volunteer and help us, uh, I welcome you. So get in touch with me. So anyway, uh, if you have time, please check out this website. It's uh, www.studiosml.net. You can check out all the stories for free because in this day and age, I believe that content has to be for free for people to want to access it. And we want to promote the design industry, we want to spread these stories. We also want the general public to understand the hardships and the struggles of designers so that hopefully, you know, it will build the ecosystem. People are willing to pay designers more and all that. And the future generation of designers will not have to struggle so much like us today. Okay, so in relation to the Studio SML uh, website, uh, uh, Design Council has very kindly offered me a space to build a teaser, uh, sort of a launch pad for the website. So I created an art installation called Abstract Creatures. Uh, the reason why I call it Abstract Creatures because it's a metaphor for design studios. Most of us started design studio because we are passionate, we just want to do design or that. We, we don't know how to do business actually. So, uh, but somehow we managed to find our way in a very organic sort of way. So that's why I think every design studio is like an abstract creature of its own. So uh, I welcome all of you to come and visit the exhibition at uh, National Design Center. It will be on until end October. So uh, please come down and have a look and be inspired. And you can get free stickers on site. <laughs> Okay, so to end off my talk today, uh, I just want to say, um, don't get misled by the wrong reasons to go into design. Um, it is very important to know where your heart is and what is your reason for going to design. And more importantly, if you start your own design studio, you must uh, have a higher aspiration because uh, running a design studio is, is very, very tough. It's not easy. Uh, so you need, um, you really need to be very convicted in uh, what you want to do. And lastly, um, I just want to say that uh, in life, um, all of us, not just designers, we need to create a nice equilibrium because um, you can't just be working all the time. No matter how passionate you are about design, you also cannot do 24 hours design a day. Uh, you need to be inspired by different things with gardening, go to the museum, watch uh, art and all these kind of things. In fact, I always encourage my designers to do that because that's, that's what inspire you. you see, everything in life inspire you. And you should, you should have a work-life balance, which I think a lot of you younger generation, uh, uh, you know, they, you, you do prioritize that, which is important. So, you know, work very hard, but also have some interest on the side and enjoy life learn how to relax, learn how to kind of separate when you are relaxing uh, and when you're working. Because at the end of the day, uh, life fuels your work and work complements your life. So uh, while you want to be a very good designer, you should also learn how to love your own life. With that, I say thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for sharing about your dreams to create beautiful things and your inspirational journey. You have certainly created much beauty through your designs. Our next speaker is Ashri Nasalim, Creative Director of Kinetic Singapore. Ashri is, by her own account, an accidental designer who jumped into the profession thinking all one needed to do was draw. She was pleasantly surprised that design encompasses so much more and has never looked back since. Ashri's work has received international recognition from the DNAD Awards, Cannes Lions Awards, The One Show, Young Guns, Tokyo Type Directors Club, the Singapore Creative Circle Awards, and not forgetting the President's Design Award. Ashri, over to you, please. Okay, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the session and thank you, Patient, for the introduction. Uh, I will share the screen. 
for my presentation. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm Astri and I'm a creative director in Creative Singapore. Creative Singapore is a fully independent creative agency and a space champion of local talent. We are 21 years old and uh, we are a small studio, but we have proved that uh, our work uh, trump size and we put our little red dot on a world map with over 500 awards and counting. So uh, this is what uh, patients say just now. So I ex joined in design industry by accident and I presently surprised that design encompasses so much more. And I added the President Design Award here. So uh, how I started is, uh, as you guys probably can tell, I'm Indonesian. I'm studied, I studied in Malaysia. And upon graduating, I actually had a job offer in Leobede KL, but my working visa got rejected. So upon this uh, visa application, I am three months jobless, but I at the same time, I needed to pay off my student loan ASAP. In Indonesia, the fresh grad uh, designer pay is around three to four hundred. So uh, it will take me a very long time to finish a student loan and Singapore dollar is better. So yeah, that's a brilliant idea. I need to, to land a job in Singapore. Uh, with my background and the fact that I'm not studying here, I know that it's, a, it's quite a far-fetched for me to, to work here. So I know I need to do something different. So I made a video with my laptop webcam. I look for the plainest wall at my home and I sit against it, set up the camera, and then I introduce myself. Hi, I'm Astri, and I'm a, a leader student looking for a job in Singapore. So then I walk towards the camera and I show my pants, I pull down my zipper, and I actually wear a shorts inside, don't worry, but I change my underwear to pixelated area. And then I put a hovering typo on top of it. Then it says, I can do ballsy work, hire me. And then I was a bit shy about it, but then I decided to send to five, four to five agencies that I wanted to join. And two weeks later, I'm on a plane to Singapore. So yeah, thank you, Steve Arik. This is my first ECD who accepted uh, my email and also offered me a job here. I then worked in my first agency for two years, but then I felt the environment didn't really suit me. So I joined Kinetic in 2012. A lot of things have happened. And yeah, I'm still here in kinetic. Sorry for the deck uh, animation problem. So these are some of the projects that I thought are bossy and some learnings from them that I'd like to share with you guys. So the first one is called Mini Vito You Drive. With a unique go-kart feel, driving a Mini is addictive, which is why drivers who test drive are more likely to buy one. But how do we get them to do a test drive in the first place? We decided to target drivers in need when the cars break down. Mini We Tow You Drive. We partnered with a tow service company and responded to breakdown calls in real time throughout Singapore. While tow trucks picked up the cars, drivers drove off to wherever they needed to go. Initially, I was very shocked. I thought like it's something that you have to pay for. So when I knew that um, there was this scheme, I thought it was actually pretty good and very innovative. I think We Told You Drive is an excellent experience and an idea because especially people in distress and need, and you guys came to save the day. I think it was a wonderful experience. When I first sat on this uh, Mini, I felt that, wow, this really can fly. The speed, the power, uh, the strongness, the strongness that uh, we really can't uh, express ourselves. As you can see, we made people do test drives without them knowing. To the other cars, have a speedy recovery. So yeah, from these projects, uh, we actually, when we did the project, we actually been working for a mini account for a few years and we feel kind of stuck on like, how do we do things different again? So uh, we keep thinking on like the sales point, uh, test drive, on how we connect to people on the social channel. But actually we realized, oh, there's this another way when our competitor's car break down. So opportunities are everywhere, including in time of crisis. Okay, the next project that I'd like to share is also for Mini. It's called Mini Extraordinary. 
Imagine ink made from sewage or plastic that you can eat. How about homes that are grown from mushrooms? Find them odd. Mini Extraordinary, an exploratory trail as unconventional as the brand, showing how odd innovations may be key to a sustainable future. To make the odd more palatable, we fuse them with familiar cultural icons in Chinatown, like the Chinese guardian lions. Traditionally cast in stone derived from destructive mining, ours were made from mushroom mycelium instead, grown to shape in the lab. Stronger than concrete yet more eco, this mushroom cement may be the building material of future homes. Or have some herbal soup boiled together with its plastic packaging. Made from seaweed, this edible plastic may yet end plastic pollution in the ocean. For our calligraphy demonstration, we had the master write in sewage ink. Instead of auspicious greetings, the words urged visitors towards zero waste. We warmed up people to the idea of eating algae with algae fortune cookies that showed the fortune of our Earth lies in their hands. Live algae was also presented as the protein of our future, right next to fishes in a seafood display like those in Chinese restaurants. No visit to Chinatown would be complete without trashy souvenirs, which in this case were really made from plastic trash. The same trash was used to build a Chinese chess table too. The trail and its 16 exhibits drew more than 74,000 visitors over three days. Mini Extraordinary, because a dose of odd could very well change our odds. Yeah, so for um, this mini extraordinary project, uh, we are initially we are kind of worried of using the new materials. After all, we are dealing with mushrooms, algae, melting plastic, and also seaweed. So I remember me and my partner were discussing and then we said, uh, yeah, we are very scared of doing this, but if we are scared and nervous on how to do it, the more we should do it. And uh, when we have managed to uh, finally finish the project and we uh, managed to do it well, uh, it felt more worthwhile. So never afraid to bring the future forward. Okay, so the next project is the Not So Convenience Store. Convenience. It's a big part of modern life. Unfortunately, so are its effects. Two billion tons of waste every year. Mountains of plastic, which take 1,000 years to break down. More plastic than fish in the seas by 2050. How can we get people to move away from this culture of convenience? Introducing the Not-So-Convenience Store. Probably the first convenience store to promote inconvenience. Reusable straws you have to wash instead of throw. Travel tumblers that add weight to your bag. Capsules that take longer to prep and clean. Compost kits that require you to live with wormy waste for months. Menstrual cups that need to be emptied and cleaned. Inconvenient zero-waste alternatives like these line the shelves of the store. The drinks fridge is full of bottles and cups that can be reused, while the freezer is repurposed as a recycling bin. Every product comes with a tag that spells out the price of convenience, as paid by the Earth. This is reinforced by other displays. At the cashier, notes on how to live more sustainably are put in the till to inspire change. Branding materials continue in the same vein, with playful twists on customer service mottos. We enlisted sustainability champions and influencers as employees of the month, serving as examples for others. We also created Instagram stickers to help spread the message on social media. Turns out, people love being inconvenienced. The not-so-convenience store was featured on the news and multiple sites online. It also evolved into a mini-movement, which saw people pledging their support. Hey, so use design to do good things. With the North Convenience Store, uh, we presented the solutions in an engaging way. And it shows that with good insights and we craft the design, we can change people's mindset. So I think maybe, like I said, I take an example of like the recent uh, tray regulation. And if you don't return your tray, you can get fined. Like maybe instead of fine, we can try like a new campaign 
like called a tra trade harder, you know, like maybe, but all I know is with design, we can present solutions to uh, solve the community problem and we can contribute to do good things with it. Okay, so the last project that I'm going to share is called Thank You Delivery Heroes. From groceries and essentials to sweet cravings and more, delivery workers bring them all. There was a time when we would rush to open the door for them. Then came COVID-19. How do we show our gratitude to those who stay out as we stay home when the door is in the way? What if we turn the barrier into a conduit of thanks by using the door for thank you notes? Thank you, delivery heroes. We created 24 posters for our delivery heroes with thank you messages that ranged from the heartfelt to the cheeky. The designs were put on our website and everyone was invited to print them and put them up. From one door to another, the movement spread. And in just a few days, hundreds of doors across the country joined in. Even cafes and restaurants took part. No printer? No problem. Many got creative and made the posters by hand. Thank you Delivery Heroes soon became a part of the national conversation on COVID-19 efforts. The idea is simple, people can download the posters from the website, add on them as they like and stick them on their doors. With the community's participation, our message of thanks was received by delivery workers all over Singapore. So while doors remain closed, our little initiative made sure that they are no barrier to open hearts. Okay, so uh, I would like to end my presentation with the, the last point, which is the right team matters. So when we first started doing the Thank You Delivery Heroes, it was at the start of the uh, of the COVID and the circuit breaker. And then is uh, the first time we transit from working physical to digital. It's also the first few projects that we work remotely, but yet it happened very seamlessly from sharing ideas to the execution, writing the headline, the poster, designing all the illustration and the, the type. So yeah, it just happened very smooth and everyone uh, contribute and support the ideas and to receive the positive responses from public. It, it was such a mood booster from uh, in the pandemic. Then, uh, yeah, so with this project, it's also kind of show me how the culture in the company matter. And also like to give it to kinetic team from the past and the present to where I am now. I'm, uh, I'm such a lucky person to be surrounded with talented people with little ego. And I also have the best mentor, Pan Lim. He's the one who's holding the right safe, keep well. So yeah, uh, I guess the last point is we'll be doing this in the long run and do it in the environment you can drive in. Thank you. And if you want to know uh, more about the work that we do in Kinetic and our, how our culture is, follow us on the Kinetic IG and we'll, be, we'll have uh, new content videos coming up. So yeah, stay tuned. Thank you, Astri, for your funny story and how you started your career in Singapore and your insightful sharing on your ballsy projects. Next, we have Steve Lawler, co-founder and head of creative of Aya. Together with co-founder Tanya Wilson, they created Aya, an educational platform that uses visual communications to nurture children's creative and problem-solving skills. Born in Iran, raised in Hong Kong, and educated in Europe, Steve attended the prestigious Fabrica Art Residency in Italy. His artistic work is an exploration of trash pop culture, colliding with the old and historical, mixing media such as computer programming, digital sculpture, painting, and printmaking. His works have also been regularly featured around the world at international institutions and independent galleries. Steve, over to you, please. Hi, everybody. Uh... Thanks, Peshwan. Thanks for saying that because uh, I hate saying that stuff. Um, right, so I'm just going to go full screen and just give me a sec. Um, there we go, the unusual network. This is like just a cover slide of where I am right now in my life. And we, we work with artists and brands and do all kinds of projects, commercial and, and um, cultural. And I think um, I'm just going to jump in and show you my first slide, which is me. This is me. Uh, that's not my car. I can't drive, but uh, a very talented painter here, Jabba, painted that car for us in a, for an event we did 
years ago. The sculpture on the left, on the right, sorry, is probably my biggest achievement. Literally, it's about four meters high, melting Superman um, uh, in response to the idea of kind of global warming. And I, and I just, I think like the point for putting this here was I, I started with a very traditional graphic design uh, entry point in Brighton on the south coast of England. And in the next few slides, I'm going to just show you how that has just unraveled into doing many, many things outside of graphic design, but, but with the same kind of thinking. So Brighton is quite a strange, surreal place. It's a very colorful little town on the south coast of England. Uh, a lot of creativity is born there, a lot of great music. And I was lucky enough to study graphic design there in 1996 to 99. I met some of the craziest people back then. And we, we were also lucky that our, our tutor brought in a lot of practicing artists from the industry. And we were very quickly kind of able to familiar ourselves, familiarize ourselves with the industry. But while I was at Brighton, one of the mm, sort of uh, key things that happened is we used to have a film teacher who took us sort of every Tuesday. And I didn't realize, but film was design. And uh, I think this kind of opened um, this little thing in my head where I, these are names of directors who you should know. So maybe just take a screenshot of this uh, page. Um, and I love the idea that film can take you backwards and forwards in time. And um, for me, this was really an interesting area to study uh, because I felt like conventional graphic design, a lot of things had been done. But when you started to infuse ideas from film, it kind of unlocked a lot of potential for me. Now, um, now I think one of those main things and one of those main ideas was the idea of the idea, the concept. So style is important and style is something that can be mimicked and, and you can practice things in a certain style, but unless uh, you have a concept, it's kind of uh, meaningless. And if you're not sure what a concept is, the concept is the message you're trying to communicate. I always grappled with that early on in my career. I was like, what's an idea? What's the concept? And it only became clearer later on when it was like, what are you trying to say um, with, your, with your work? And so translating your message into visual formats is AKA visual communication. Um, and I became really obsessed with this idea of communicating with images. And so back in the 90s, there's a famous Italian photographer called Oliviero Toscani, uh, responsible for a lot of these um, uh, provocative um, kind of constructed images to do with uh, in sort of human issues like war, like famine, like uh, racism. And, and here's a really great example. And so what I started to do was I, I was like, who's making this stuff? And I found out that there was a real place called Fabrica. And, they, and this was in Italy and you basically, it was kind of like a creative school. So I applied to get there and by some freak of nature chance, I, I got in. And, um, and when I was there, I found out they were responsible for this magazine called Colors. And um, I don't know if any of you know about this magazine, but I think it, within the sort of creative community in the early days, this was a real driver for uh, ideas. So for instance, they'd have a, a, an issue about travel or smoking or, or genetic um, modification. And they, they basically work with photographers and writers from around the world to, to kind of um, analyze a topic. And of course this became, uh, what I thought was really interesting was this global perspective and this creation of a kind of visual language. And so I kind of took that idea and I was like, what if it was instead of photographers, what if we invited illustrators and graphic designers? And because that was like my domain, um, I thought it would be really interesting. So, um, so that's what, what, uh, what I did. I invited a lot of my artist friends from around the world to visualize trust and um, I got a whole range of responses and, and it became such a fun exercise. You know, all these artworks would come in and um, basically organized the exhibition about this. 
Um, everyone did the artwork for free. Everyone thought it was an exciting idea. And plus they were friends. So, so I was able to kind of curate this collection. I uh, did the exhibition and the exhibition was only for one day. So it was a bit like, oh man, that, that should be around for longer, which triggered the thought, why don't we make it into a, a kind of magazine as well? You know, taking the idea of colors, but opening it up to illustrators and designers. And uh, this, is a, this was a free publication. I'm not sure if any of you know it, uh, but it was around for about 10 years in my old company, Cult. And, um, and one of the ideas, one of the one of the things we did was we took a theme and then we just asked artists who wanted to be involved and it became a really exciting project for us and then of course that content rolled out into exhibitions into installations um and animations and, <laughs> and, and i love these fun facts kind of mind-blowing <clears throat> like for example um the more to die on your birthday than any other day of the year. Now, I don't know why that is, but I found it like amazing. And I just think uh, educating with illustration can be so powerful and, and, and using the skills and the tricks of, of someone with a visual kind of uh, toolkit to use it for these purposes, which gave birth to this idea of Aya um using art to educate and and inspire and so um this is why i'm here talking to you and with the design uh the president's design awards and i think we're really pleased that we got recognized for this because essentially it still is a very independent zine we do it for fun we do it for free and a lot of the artists give us work and and there's a lot of support within the ecosystem um and uh, and we also animate be careful what you click and download from the internet about six thousand new computer viruses are created every month so that was that was working with an artist called uh, Yellow Marshmallow, Ida, who's from Singapore, and she's wonderful. And if you don't know her work, you should try and find her. Um, I want to show you this. This was I was introduced to this uh, when I was first leaving art school, and it's the first things first manifesto. And and why it's important is um, it's it's it's. It's bringing up the idea of uh, graphic design for commercial use and, and graphic design for social use. So um, what I want to do is, um, I'd love you to go and find this and read this, okay? I tried to just highlight um, some of the text that I think is important, which is basically, um, sort of it, it sort of echoes what Kelly said and Astri, you know, there's a lot of glamour involved in the industry and people making uh, graphics to support in, um, existing kind of grown brands and, and create a very kind of materialistic world. And I think that's fine and it plays a part, but I think we should also consider what uh, what other things we can do with our skill sets. So I've, I've done a little poll, maybe Peishwan, you wanna bring it up. Um, should um, design be used to sell products? or to change mindsets. Now, I'm not gonna judge you, but uh, you can answer this. It's, there's a, there's, you can't say both, um, but what I really want you to do is just to think about it because po possibly you haven't um, encountered this question before. And, and the real purpose of this is just to, um, you know, make you think about it. Um, so first things first, this was originally made in, uh, in 1967 or 69, I think. Um, but please do Google it and please know about it. And and it says, we the undersigned. So there's a list of graphic designers from um, the early days who are kind of some of my my design heroes, you know, like Bob Gill, Alan Kitching, um, and names you probably don't know. But if you go and find who signed that petition, you will find a wealth of amazing visual uh, designers and illustrators and things like that. So, wow, look, there's a very uh, conscientious crowd here. 94% uh, believe that uh, designs for changing mindset. So that's cool. I feel like we're passing the baton to some, some good listeners here. 
Um, I've only got a couple of minutes left. So what I'm going to do is back to my presentation. Um, what have I got? Okay. Tips to find your voice. What, one of the main ones is um, things like you're doing now. Attend conferences. I know they're expensive sometimes, but watch the, watch the aftermath on um, YouTube. Screenshot this slide because I've got a feeling I'm going to get kicked off the chat in a minute. Um, make zines. Go to exhibitions, organize exhibitions, experiment on your own work, um, arrange lunches with creative friends or people that you don't know and, and try and bring people together. Find your design heroes. Whenever you see a cool piece of work, try and find out who made it. All these brands have creative directors. Go and find out who's the creative director of Nike. Who, you know, go and dig a bit deeper. Then you start to know your domain more. And then, of course, look outside your domain as well for inspiration. We don't want everything homogenized and then looking the same. So you are young and wild. Don't let them tame you. I think I'm going to leave it there. I had, a, I had an extra video here, um, Colors News Machine. Just Google it and watch it, OK? Because there's probably uh, more time for you to enjoy this on, a, on another time. So again, if you just want to screenshot this, that's me. I'm, I'll, I'll talk to you in the in the wrap up later. Thank you, Steve, for sharing about your creative journey that spanned across the globe. Last but not least, let us welcome Larry Pay, founder and creative director of N Larry. Larry began his design career at Men's Folio, Singapore's first men's magazine, and over the years, his work has been in internationally recognized with awards from the likes of DNAD, One Show, Tokyo Type Directors Club, and Singapore Creative Circle Awards. In 2014, Larry was conferred the President's Design Award for Designer of the Year, and in 2016, his work for Bind Artisan was conferred Design of the Year. Larry, over to you, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Patient. Let me try to set my slides first. Okay, um, full screen, right, Patient? Yep, full uh, screen. I'll continue my slide. I think we don't have much time, so I'll make it quick. Uh, I think this is not new. I've said it many times. I'll start with my hero, um, Fabian Barron. So I kind of like looked at Harper's Bazaar when he was designing back then, and um, I didn't know what role this was, but. I love fashion, I love typography. I don't even know it's called typography. And it's like so beautiful. And wow, I was drawn to his world and I buy nothing but Harper's Bazaar. I'll get my hands on my friend's copy. So I I digged out like what Steve mentioned earlier, like who the hell is this guy? I looked at the credit page. And back then, <clears throat> I'm quite old. We don't have that kind of Google or what have you. So we can only go around looking for like, who is this Fabian Baron? And that's how my world of design began. I uh, wanted to be like him, you know. So yeah, find your hero is very important. And uh, in the business, um, some sort of advice I have uh, littered throughout the slides. You gotta choose your allies carefully. Um, not just your friends or who you work with, but your client, if you have a commercial client. Um, because people suck you dry and you get pissed off, you get angry. And I always tell fellow creatives that we, I feel naked. You know, I, I work with lingerie models, but I feel more naked than them. Because uh, someone like a musician or an artist or a designer, you put a thing out there, you, uh, you succumb to scrutiny, you succumb to people saying, oh, thumbs up, thumbs down. So yeah, you want to work with people who appreciate you, bring you to a high level. Like in this case, um, um, on the left, it's Royston Tan, one of the uh, famous uh, filmmaker here. Um, not many people know that we're actually friends since uh, secondary school. In fact, we went to the uh, first day we met together so that we can go to the secondary school together. Uh, but we were both misfits in school and we were looked down upon. And like all oh, these two artists, I don't think they're going to survive when they grow up, you know. So we, we clicked, we bonded. And till today, uh, I just finished his, um, uh, the design for his new film called 24. We worked on 881. 4.30 and a couple of films and I never once asked him how much he can pay me. So, yeah. Um, on the right, standing on the shoulders of Giant, uh, 
you see Pan, you see Chris Lee and the Jackson and what and, and this, I think the seven rings. And we know we need 10 rings like Shang-Chi. So yeah, later on we brought three more guys in. Um yeah, so like Chris Lee was my from Asylum, he was my first boss when I came out of army. Um yeah, he said, Well, I'm full, I couldn't hire anybody else. But what the hell, man, just come in the next day. Again, I started working without knowing how much I, I was paid. I only knew when I got my first paycheck. And, uh, and I just met him last week for a uh, lunch and asked him for some advice. Yeah, it's, you know, in Chinese, they have this saying that it's an, I mean, like a, a day of a teacher, it becomes like a father for life. So it's kind of like a bit cheesy, but yeah, I, I always look up to all these people. So yeah, I think choose your friends, your allies carefully and the clients you work with. Um, I'm not going to share any of our projects because right from the start, I, I love this idea that good designs disappear. And I've been figuring out from day one how to make, make me and make the company's work disappear. But yet at the same time, the essence of it remains and the good that it, it delivers remain for a long, long time. So anyway, that's kind of still work in progress. But um, the one thing I really enjoyed was our rebranding. We took uh, 2019 where after our company's trip to Tokyo, Immediately we came back, it was a lockdown and we took the time to Zoom to work and we took the time to rebrand ourselves, you know, through Zoom occasional meetups. And yeah, I'm happy to say that uh, I, this is one of the slides where I, dis I, I, when I created the company's name and Larry, it's about putting a spotlight on anybody or anything right in front of me. And yeah, this year on, um, this is the new logo and I want to showcase this one that is made by my wonderful intern. Um, Ex intern who is now the design Singapore scholar in Tokyo, and so I pay him a little bit of money to do a bit of uh, animation and what have you project so that he can, you know, do his otaku dream of I don't know cosplay dressing. <laughs> Just kidding, but yeah, this is what he did for us. Oops, he's not playing. Uh, never mind. I'll skip the video. Sorry, Shannon. Oh, he's playing now. So it gave you a brief, what do you want to do with it? So he did this animation like, oh, so short and simple. So kudos to him. Um, and uh, this is one of the things that um, after 16 years in the business, we actually codify this whole thing called the design with sole purpose. And it's something I'm very proud of, me and the team that we have put it together where, um, you know, people say purpose is very important, but we always talk about soul. And that, dif that differentiates what you do like for example, an elevator music versus someone like Richie Sakamoto or Bill Evans and you know, Billie Eilish. So how do you codify soul? And in a way, we put it into the very simple uh, seven dimensions. Of course, there are a lot more to it, but putting on a lay, to a layman, this is what it means. Um, this is a beautiful illustration by uh, Moteas, this illustrator, where, you know, it's about passion, it's about uniqueness, about relevance, it's about people, it's about ownability sustainability and ethics. And we use this framework to um, filter out the people we want to work with, as well as looking at the projects that we work with. As brand consultants, increasingly, like I mentioned, a lot of our work disappears. We don't create anything physical anymore. For example, um, like we work with the in-house creative team. We work with the in-house creative directors and the marketing people, social media people. We give guidelines, we give like the do's and the don'ts. I want to highlight a little bit about the don't because, because in the work that we do, like early on, some of the speakers mentioned, we deliver things, we create things, we sell things and so on and so forth. But I'm more interested in what you don't do. And a lot of times our work revolves around that. Like, oh, let's do this, let's do that. Let's roll this out, let's roll that out. But we always ask, no, 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 why do you want to roll this out? Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to create another thing? Um, so yeah, so a lot of this, kind of a lot of soul searching. Um, yeah, we also developed something called the soul search methodology as well. So anyway, I'm not going to go too deep into this. Um, this is my team. We are surprisingly still a very small team. We grow, we contracted, and but in the end, these are uh, five of us that um, who made all the magic you see or you don't see behind the scene. Uh, that's done by Celeste and a wonderful illustration with our names from the ears across to our faces. And my last word of advice, um, 
don't burn bridges. Because you know, in this creative world, in the business world, there's a lot of money, there's ego at work. So unless someone cross the line that you set, otherwise it's not worth it. It's just we're in the business of people, of course, and the environment and so on and so forth. But you know, there's nothing worth burning the bridges or make you so unhappy or make you do stupid things that in the end you couldn't sleep at night. So life is short. You gotta preserve your life by sleeping more. And with that, I end my presentation. Very short one. Um, thank you. If you want to follow us, uh, and Larry.com and at and Larry Handel. So for me, I'm really kind of out of social media for a long time. So you can follow my team's work here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, for sharing the soul behind your design studio and your sagely advice to designers out there. I'll now hand the time over to our moderator, Felix, for the Q&A section. Audience, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A function. Felix is the co-founder and CEO of the global mentorship platform Amazing Design People List, ADP List. He's also a product designer and tech entrepreneur on a mission to bring equity to the world through purposeful designs. His focus spans across product, design, and growth. Welcome, Felix, and the recipients. Thank you so much, Patient. Hey, everyone. Nice to be here um, and hope all of you have enjoyed the presentation as much as I had as well uh, through the past 40 minutes. So we will have a, around 30 minutes for the moderation uh, where we can ask Q&A to the uh, four speakers here. Um, and then obviously, if we will have a chance, you have a chance to ask questions. So if you have already have any questions, feel free to put it on the Q&A chat um, and I will be picking them up later as well. But before that, I would like to start off the, the, the panel discussion with some of the questions that I personally noted. Um, you know, really curious about some of the work that the four panelists had done. Um, but mainly, you know, uh, really to dive deeper into the industry in general, right? And, and I think this is something that uh, all of you uh, would appreciate more uh, at each stage of your career, right? Uh, and, and assuming that most is also just starting out as well, right? Uh, so this question is for all the, all the, mod, uh, all the panelists, um, you know, feel free to just jump in in no order. Um, but the first question that, that I'm really curious about after hearing that, uh, you know, your stories and your learnings, is how has the pandemic impacted the uh, design projects that you've embarked on, uh, you know, today, right? Uh, whether be it a project that has been ongoing during the pandemic or even before that or during the, the pandemic, how has COVID-19 impacted your projects so far? Uh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll just share a bit. Um, I think COVID-19 has uh, impacted every business, everyone globally, one way or another, big or small. Um, so as, uh, I mean, for us as a small studio, we were, we were badly affected too because uh, as a design studio, a lot of our works are, are re related to marketing and events. And then last year during the circuit break, uh, I think a lot of companies suddenly just pull the plug on a lot of projects no? because they, they can't, they don't know when the government is going to leave the circuit break and whatever so um so it was a sudden shock you know i think for for many I, I guess not just for me but for us as well so we were uh, during the circuit break suddenly really just stay home and shake leg so uh good and bad la. i mean for me it was a, uh, I i mean after i got getting over the shock of like yeah no job um it it, it became like a, a long needed break for me because i think uh when before before the COVID, uh, many of us uh, just blindly work and work and work and work. You know, we work so hard, though, no? and we never allow ourselves that kind of break. You know, that we we are entitled to actually. You know, so after twenty years of working, for the first time in my life, I took a proper break. You know, <laughs> of two months of doing nothing much at all. You see, so uh, so yes, work was very slow, but uh, I think something good came out of it, which is why I, I just now I shared that I started a self-initiated project to do SML. Yeah. So that's for me. Maybe uh, we'll hear what others have to say. Thanks for sharing that, Kelly. Anyone has anything else to add on that point? All right. Okay, we will move on to the next question. Um, that is, is also regarding the industry in general. You know, I, I think four of you here uh, has a lot of experience, way more than, than myself, uh, you know, decades of experience. And I'm just curious from a perspective of visual communications industry, 
how has that changed uh, since you started and where do you think it will be in the next five to 10 years? Larry, do you want to kickstart this, this question? Oh, shit, I wasn't thinking. Um, <laughs> uh, well, sorry, come again, summarize the question again. So, so how has the visual communication industry changed since you started and where do you think it will be in the next five to 10 years? Well, the, the quick run through my brain, it's, uh, uh, it started off as simple as my journey where, oh, it's beautiful, you know, let's create uh, wonderful things out there to, you know, in the 90s, you have IDEO coming in. Until now, you've got all this talk about empathy, uh, design thinking, and oh, whatever, what have you out there. It has caught on and everybody somehow know what this whole thing is about and putting in the putting design or ability to do all these things that think like a designer in the hands of everyone out there. <clears throat> so I feel that it's no longer about uh, what you put out there, but like I said, it's about um, what collectively, how we should put our ideas forward for a better world. I mean, in that sense, I mean, kind of cliche to say that, but better work can be in many forms, right? Like, um, like how Kinetic is doing. Uh, that's a wonderful one way of doing it. But some people are like making wonderful music. You know, it's to calm people during the pandemic or during distressful times. You, you can't brush it off and say that that's kind of like small compared to those guys who are doing uh, bigger jobs out there. So, uh, yeah, for us, it's, I guess, more and more, so searching is required in a way like we read about how china is doing right now uh, of course i got different views on different friends be it from the european side to uh, china side to uh, singapore as well um but yeah i mean they're doing their form of cleansing and um so searching so i feel that increasingly whether it's peer pressure or not uh, that might become something that um that we knee jerk for a lot of people, including our industry, where it's like this pandemic, wow, you know, you got to figure out this, got to figure out that. Um, so coming back to just now, an earlier question about our work, um, it hasn't changed except the fact that, well, we can't go down and measure stuff, look, look at the location. If we do a, like we have a project where it's a journey, user journey mapping, and, you know, we cannot walk around yeah. as with what we wanted. So these are technical things which I'm not really concerned about. Right, we can we can measure it later on or whatever using technology. But again, it's that rethink about like will your ideas work pre or post? And for us, it didn't really matter that much because we were already just trying to figure out something that we can design for a long, long time. Um, sure. Of course, the, the things that we design may not last that long, but the ideas behind it, the concept, like uh, what Steve mentioned behind it, what do you want to communicate, should last a long, long time, uh, if not yeah. forever. Um, so I, I'm very critical about what we put out there or not put out there. So that's kind of why how I feel the industry uh, might be kind of developing, in my opinion, in, in at least in my world. All right. Thank you so much for that, Larry. Um, this question... Yeah. Next, maybe well, I will just uh, add on a bit about this, uh, how it has changed. Um, I, I think in, in terms of uh, how we work as designers, I, I believe for most of us, we would say that it hasn't changed much, except that the fees has gone down. And uh, why is this phenomenon like that? So there is a major disruption right now in the world, uh, in the design world globally, because of platforms such as Fiverr, Upwork, and Guru. Um, I think it is um, it's something that we all have to tackle, you know, and the young generations will have to face this kind of uh, competition. Because in the past, without all this platform, um, for any clients, like if you want a designer, you have no choice, you have to go to a, a firm, right? You know, a physical firm, and then you ask them to do it. But now they have so many options, you know, they go to Fiverr, Upwork, they, they pay for $50, they get a logo, $100 or, whatever they get, unlimited changes and all that. It, it's very bad. It destroys the ecosystem in a lot of countries, including Singapore, because uh, a lot of uh, potential clients, they will say, uh, like you, you, let's just say you charge them, you said, I charge you $10,000 for a logo. And they said, huh, uh, why so expensive? I go Fiverr, I pay $50. Why should I pay $10,000? Because 
the, the, the bottom line is that a lot of clients, honestly, it's not their fault, but they cannot discern the difference between, say, a $50 logo and a 10000 logo and what it comes with it, you know, whether the applications, the style guide, and so on and so forth. Uh, all they know is that, oh, logo, just one small thing like that, right? Um, and they also don't care about concept and all that. So it's a very, um, it's, it's a very, I think it's going to be a challenge that, uh, that moving forward, we all have to face because Singapore is also becoming very, very expensive. So um, if you, the bigger firms are already kind of like trying to, you know, use uh, foreign manpower, they set up branch office in Vietnam or in China, or well, China also not cheap now. Um, so they set up offices to kind of like uh, even out the, the manpower cost, you see. But for small studios like uh, like me and Larry, we, we can't go and set up a branch there. We still have to hire local. So the grads every year come out, they ask for more and more money, but uh, the fees is going down and down because clients are not uh, paying us so much. The ecosystem is honestly, if you ask me, very disrupted in uh, recent years. So I don't really know what is the answer for it. I don't have the answer, um, but I'm hoping, which is why with uh, platforms such as Studio SML and, and other IA and other kind of platforms that we can slowly educate. The, it's going to be a long, long process. Yeah? Educate the young generation, educate the general public and all that of what design means, what design really is, and uh, how difficult it is to do a good design. So hopefully through all this uh, uh, outreach platform, you know, we can we can educate the public more so that in time to come, we have more uh, discerning clients, we have more uh, uh, clients who are able to tell good and bad design, then maybe hopefully we can we can build, you know, uh, the Singapore ecosystem. If not, then we are, our young designers will be fighting against $5, $10 designer with Fiverr, which is very, very bad. Yeah, so this is, I think, the biggest disruption from the days that we come out without having to fight this to this where now, you know, it's it just, there is no more boundaries already. People can hire designers from everywhere in the world. And there are a lot of third world countries also, they train their own designers and they are hungry, you know. They will do a logo for cheap, they'll do a lot of things for cheap. But in their country, maybe $50 is a lot of money, you see. And um, so um, it's going to be tough. Lah. Okay. All right. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that, Kelly. I think Steve raised his hand. And Steve, do you have something to add on? Uh, yeah, possibly a more optimistic note. Um, I think the digital landscape, basically there's more and more designers, there's more and more creators, there's more and more design graduates. So you're going to find yourself uh, pitching against a lot more peers. And so what you need to do is to invent your own roots. And I think things like designing... Uh, virtual um, spaces, creating opportunities for design, whether they're for commercial use or, or cultural use, um, creating in those spaces. And so that doesn't necessarily mean programming because it's the same thought process of architecture, but in a virtual realm. And so if you can start to think along those lines, you're going to create a lot of opportunities to yourself because in five years time, there's the there's just going to be so much to experience and you can really carve out an area uh, that doesn't exist yet. And let's say you are a, um, I don't know, let's say a fashion brand. You can create a virtual experience where people go shopping inside and that will have within the experience uh, really good design like product design, architecture, graphic design, interface design, and, and people are already getting into that space. So I think it would just be worthy of taking note of who's doing what in the so-called metaverse, but, but just think of them as online extensions and, and they're getting richer and deeper. And, and honestly, there's gonna be so much work around. Thank you so much for sharing that, Steve. And you know, uh, on in in recent days, we have heard a lot about these digital uh, arts as well, which is something of a new avenue where where designers and artists can go in. Uh, which brings me to my next question uh, regarding you know design and art. I believe it's a question to to uh, Steve and Kelly, right? So uh, Kelly and Steve, you have worked, and this is a question from audience, by the way. Um, so you have worked with artists and. For, with, for, with a lot of artists and for Steve in particular, you have created artworks like Melting Superman. Where do you see the line between art and design? And is there a 
line between art, art and design. Art, okay, so I mean, if you look at art in the broad sense, like there's there's abstract art, there's there's dance, there's music, you know, and I think sometimes they are trying to communicate something, and sometimes they are left ambiguous and open to interpretation. And I think where design starts to take over is when um, the art is trying to say something, and then you can kind of measure its effectiveness in that sense, in, in terms of like uh, whether people understand that message or whether they get it. Um, it's, it's kind of simple as that really. I, I think it depends on um, how, how you look at it, because uh, if, you do, if you do design for fun, you know, at home, you create your own poster and all that. Uh, the, the line is indeed very blurred, you know, it could, it could be considered art, you know, digital art and all that. Um, but in, in, the, in the light that if you are providing a service to a client who hire you to do a design, uh, then there's usually a very specific brief uh, that you have to meet, you know, and there are uh, things that you need to achieve, you know, uh, very real KPIs and all that. Uh, this is where I think it differs from uh, art, where usually you are quite free to create, you know, um, and you don't really need to uh, do it with, uh, with, you know, a client's brief and all that. You can, you can really do what you want. So I think um, that is uh, more or less the difference. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, you know, uh, I think I, I really agree on, on the side of like the, the art and, and, and design because one of the things is like design is more science than, than art, right? Art is where you can express your own creative freedom, whereas design, there is some metrics to that because of success. Um, this question is for Astri. Um, there is a young designer, actually graphic designer, who just graduated from university last year, and uh, she's finding it a little bit hard to um, find her match in this field, right? Uh, find her place in this field of graphic design. So she would love to learn a little bit more about um, how uh, you are thinking about career or how one could actually find their right fit um, in their career. And it seems like uh, the question is directed to you. Perhaps uh, she, she look up to you in terms of career-wise. So we'd love to learn a little bit more about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for the question. So I think for me, uh, not the best person to answer this question because graphic design uh, for me is very wide and I kind of apply my skills to many disciplinary and I actually quite enjoy it meaning I design books and uh, I design for digital and uh, space and I think it's quite refreshing for me to like every time uh, when I receive a different kind of brief or like I want to I wanted to do uh, different things and then I explore in that area so I guess uh, I'm still confused as well and my advice is just to keep exploring sounds good yeah I would also encourage you to keep exploring as someone who is also uh, very new in, in, in career as well I'm sure everyone could say the same um, okay so one question that I think is really relevant to everyone here uh, which I think uh, anyone can jump in and answer in no order. Um, it's like, you know, I, I think Singapore is a very small market and, you know, it's, it's still a growing growing space. It's not too matured yet. Um, but are there any tips where we can, you know, uh, reach out to a wider market beyond Singapore? And, and what are some of the actionable steps that one can take if they want to, you know, do work outside of Singapore? Yeah, uh, reach a wider audience. Uh, maybe I'll answer this question. So I think for us in Kinetic, how we reach to the wider audience is by uh, using social and digital. Now, nowadays, there are a lot of platforms and there are like a, a lot of Zoom webinars where we can connect with different kind of artists and different kind of audience. And uh, now it's pretty exciting in this industry that uh, our visual communication can go uh, in a two-way communication. But at last time, we just like post our work or like go on TV and create a TVC. But now we can post it in our IG channel and then we can see how people react to it. And then we can connect to them and chat with them just by sending a DM. 
from the three of the other panelists. Any things to add on to that side of reaching audience outside of Singapore? Well, online seems the obvious thing. I mean, there's so many communities um, of musicians and especially like regional, um, you can, as a visual designer, enter the space of music and uh, offer your mm, sort of powers to create album covers or to create visuals for um, music videos. You can also identify what music videos you like, write to those directors, build bridges overseas through the internet. I mean, I, I, I don't think anybody really thinks of just being in Singapore and it's, and it's kind of siloed. I think Singapore thrives off its nodes to other networks and it wouldn't mm. really be able to operate um, without those kind of influences or exchanges. And yes, Korea, Japan, have find friends and peers in those in those places. Get on Behance and start chatting to people whose work you like. You know, get onto uh, Twitter and start following artists who are from other countries, and and you'll soon find lots of similarities. And um, within within weeks, you will have a, a external network. Gotcha. Thanks so much for that. Steve. I think one of the uh, one of the other platforms that uh, young designers can uh, look into is also really to join more competitions. Uh, so, if without the COVID, usually like uh, global competitions, they will also have a, a big award ceremony and all that. And those are very good places to network. You know, you will meet a lot of like-minded people and designers, and that's how you can start to do some kind of collaboration and all that. And then. Um, you can you can you can kind of like have a kind of outreach. So um, I think um, a lot of these kind of uh, conferences, competitions, uh, design festivals, uh, like London Design Festival is uh, quite a good place also to meet people. So I think these are all very good platforms for young designers to to go out there. First of all, to to be inspired, and at the same time to to meet like-minded designers. Uh, from other countries and that's usually how you start to build relations and network outside of the country. Gotcha. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Kerry. I, I completely agree. There's a lot of communities and events where um, you can go to and there's just a lot of uh, international exposure there. Um, one of the last few questions that I picked out from the audience, which is really interesting. Uh, this question is from Felicia. Uh, she is an aspiring graphic designer who initially came from a background of animation and uh, she intends to go to the university, uh, but is struggling to make her portfolio stand out in her application. I, I, I guess, you know, it's not just a, about university application, but in, in job as well. So uh, do you have any tips to, uh, to how to, on how, how to find your voice and make your work uh, truly stand out amongst, you know, all the thousands of designers and artists out there? Uh, customize your application, you know, to whatever company you're, applying to. I think uh, that often works. Um, find out the name of your person you're applying to and um, push their buttons. Uh, yeah, it's, it's competitive and there's some very innovative portfolios that, that land on my desk quite often. And the ones that stand out um, tend to be uh, less generic, like something that a corporate portfolio would go to Ogilvy or something like that. So when, when it's resonating with the, the person you're trying to um, get a job from, I think that might mean making 20 different portfolios. Uh, it's just the way of the world, unfortunately. Yeah, I think uh, just now Asri gave her, her own experience and advice, right? Like, <laughs> take off your pants but, or do whatever you want, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is I always think, uh, a... if... yeah go for it yeah, sorry yeah, uh, I think if I can add on maybe uh, for Felicia to find out like what's the story that you can tell about uh, yourself so that that can be your cover letter and also of course designing it well and I think uh, now that I'm in, a, in the other side of the uh, application right it's also about the right timing so sometimes like it can be a good portfolio, but it's not the right time. So uh, just keep sending to the places that you want. 
Well, I have something uh, borrowed from, um, you know, the, the Mr. Y, I call him. The power of why. So I think it's very important to be like what it's very important to kind of be very clear about why you do what you do and make that come across very immediately, instantly to whoever you're applying. Like what Steve said, press the right button. So if you know if you're gonna attract a rock rock star kind of a design company, then you better look like you're about to to start a rock concert, right? So uh, why you do what you do is very important because increasingly, even in my job, not just about students application or whatever, but even to clients, we're talking about some of them are really, you know, ultra high net worth people. When you ask them, strangely, very few people can tell you clearly, succinctly, what, why they do what they do, you see. So like, why do you start this business? What, what, what the hell is going on? So when you start the whatever that you want to apply, it's, that's very important for me, in my opinion. 100% agree there, Larry. One of the things that I, that I learned as well is the, the why beyond the what, you know, like um, people people would often buy into your why than, than your what, you know, just like how um, Apple markets themselves and people fall in love with the brand, not because of the things that they build, but just how they make you feel, right? Like, and their why as well. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Okay, last question for all the panelists and obviously if you could chime in um, however short your answer may be. Um, this question is by a, the audience um, and, and the question goes that, uh, may I know what is your take uh, on learning and doing design overseas uh, if an international exposure is important for young designers? For example, whether they go, going overseas uh, for studies or um, for, for any work, uh, you know, is that important for, for young designers? Is that a competitive advantage as well? Uh, I might answer that. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I think travel is pretty key to creativity. I think um, you often find when you're overseas, you're looking at things through a different lens. And, um, and sometimes when you come back, you're looking through an alternative lens. And... And just that act alone, you know, okay, I'm not talking about a beach holiday, uh, maybe going to Taipei just for a sort of couple of, well, five days and just seeing how things are done differently and, and people's mindsets and um, how they serve food and, and all these things. And, and the more you do that, the more open and broad-minded you become and the more you can um, take on board new ideas and, and, and weave them and bake them into your, your own uh, thinking. And I think... Uh, it's kind of proven that travel breeds creativity because of that reason. Um, I think definitely if, uh, if you have the opportunity to uh, study abroad or to travel, uh, that, that is great, you know, because being a designer is not just about working in your own silo, you know, and... Um, uh, usually you actually get your inspiration from a lot of things, uh, you know, in, you go to art museums, you go to dance, you go to theatre, you go to, you read books, you watch movie and all that, uh, it's so many things, you see. So uh, sometimes what we see here is different from what you see from different countries, you see. So it's about, it's always about building this uh, deep depository of imageries in mind so that when you design, you actually can tap from this. And then uh, you can come up with something that is that is of your own. But without this repository, then you when you need to design something, you go to Pinterest. Then the tendency is that you are going to copy. You see, so I think uh, opening up your eyes to go and travel and all that is always very good. And also that just now uh, in relation to the earlier question that uh, uh, someone asked, like how to build network. You know, a lot of your network is actually also built from school days. You know. Um, Larry got to know, know Royston in school and you know after so many years they're still collaborating you know um, a lot of my classmates and, and uh, friends from you know from secondary school to NUS uh, that I'm still in touch with uh, some of them also become my clients you see so they um, uh, they also help you as you go along so if you go abroad um, immediately you know your your network your friends are, are a global kind of thing and uh, that that might give you a sort of a, 
a, a fast track, you know, to building a more global kind of network. So one way or another, um, I mean, whether you study in Singapore, you study abroad or that, uh, just make it work for you. And uh, if you have the chance to go abroad, that's great. Awesome. Larry and Ashley, anything to add to this final question? Mm, no, I think they're all valid. Um, but I guess it's, what I want to touch on maybe it's about local, you know, globalization because um, a lot of times, sometimes you'll be, like I have a friend who, who went to France, you know, study, not in design, but then come back and totally become like a French. And then start, you know, complaining about things that like, you're a different person and I don't know you anymore. What's going on? So I, I feel, and, and that versus, like, I always joke about our ministers, you know, they're Harvard, they're from where they come back, they still sound like us. You know, they still walk, walk the ground like us. So I, I think it's about, like, putting yourself, you, you, we are all very unique. So having all these things, um, experiences and sharing and what have you, but it shouldn't change who you are. It should amplify it. So I think you got to know your the root of who you are in that sense. So anything else is on top of it and, you know, like a clay, you just mold it and you know, make use of it. I, I don't know when I'm kind of on, still on point. <laughs> sorry. No, that, is a, that is a very good point. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, for sorry, of course, I was trying to answer questions from the chat and trying to listen. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, that is actually a very valid point is the localization part uh, and especially about the ministers. That's 100% true. Did notice that as well. Uh, Estri, anything else to add on? I mean, your friend from France maybe in the house and they go and poison you. <laughs> no, I already made it very clear. Cool, like, hey, you know, what's going on there? Eh? Now you eat baguette and whatever. and you know. Yeah. But I mean, for me, it's a that uh, um, Yesterday, I was just in the restaurant with a client, right? Then it's an Italian restaurant and I love cappuccino and it's afternoon. I freaking ask for cappuccino and then that guy's like, oh no, it's not cappuccino after 10. You, know, you call me American, call me Singaporean, whatever. I want my cappuccino. So I do that in, <laughs> all the time and I got slammed, but it's who I am. Yeah, you know? yeah. No. that's true. Okay. Ashri, you have something to add, right? Ashri? Uh, yeah, so I, I think I just, I agree with all the panelists' answers. I think uh, if you can study abroad, it's a uh, luxury and you should do it if you can. But if you cannot, then uh, go travel. And if you still can't afford that travel, trip, uh, go explore Singapore because there are actually quite a lot of things to do. be inspired from here. And also you can take inspiration from people as well, uh, movies and other people's designs work. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And for the people watching this, thank you all for your question, right? Uh, three takeaways that from here is obviously the first one is to stand out. You have to be yourself, have to put out your, your work out there. Understand what truly makes you different. Um, and the other takeaway that I have is the most recent question right now is that international international exposure is very important. So, um, you know, you, you can go out there, uh, virtual events, uh, communities, and meet international friends, have calls as well, um, you know, have different perspective, right? Uh, finally, I think um, that, that could help you, you know, create a lot of things in design or, or in art, whichever you, that, that you're in. Yeah. So thank you all so much for, for this amazing session. And thank you all for the four panelists for being here with us today as well. Thank you Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you so much once again, Felix and recipients. To our audience, thank you for your overwhelming interest and our sincere apologies that we couldn't finish answering all of your questions. We'll try to answer all your questions in the post-event EDM, so please look out for that over the next couple of days. In the meantime, we'd appreciate it if you could complete a short survey for this webinar to help us improve on our future programs. Please scan the QR code for the survey form. Share with us your greatest takeaway from the webinar and you will stand a chance to win an exclusive PDA 2020 publication featuring the stories and voices of our recipients. And if you'd like to find out more about the various upcoming programs the National Design Centre has lined up, do also scan the QR code that you see on the screen. And with that, we will be ending the session for today. Thank you once again to all of our speakers and to all of you for spending your Friday afternoon with us. We look forward to seeing you at our future events. Have a good evening and weekend ahead. Goodbye!